October 1st meeting of the Gloucester County Board of Supervisors to order. Ms. Steele, will you call the roll? Mr. Gibson? Yes. Doc <laughs> Dr. Orth? Here. Mr. Smith? Here. Mr. Hudson? Here. Mr. Crisco is absent. Mr. Bazzani? Present. Mr. Nicosia? Here. You have a quorum. We all join Pastor Susan Smith of New Life Ministry Center uh, with the Pledge of Allegiance. I mean, the invocation. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the day you've given us and thank you for the opportunity to pray over and bless this meeting tonight as the business of Gloucester County is discussed. I thank you, Lord, for each member of this group sacrificing of their time to serve. I ask that you give each member wisdom, understanding, and discernment as all topics are discussed and decisions made. I pray daily for those in authority as your word has commanded us to do. I pray tonight that all topics can be discussed with peace and unity. While some discussions may be difficult to agree upon, I pray that open discussions and honesty can make often difficult decisions happen without anger and disappointment. I pray for all residents and property of Gloucester County, including this local governing body, the administration, Department of Public Safety, Public Works, and the business of our county, as this committee works for the good of its citizens. We thank you for this great county of Gloucester we call home, its history, and for the future of it. In the precious name of our Lord, amen. 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 Oh, can we have a moment of silence for the people of North Carolina and South Carolina? Yes. Florida, Georgia. That were devastated by this horrible hurricane. Mm -hmm. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to ask for the approval of the minutes from May 21st and May 29th. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, Adoption of the agenda. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, approval of the consent agenda. There's no consent agenda item, so matters presented by the board. Yeah, uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I had a, a, an invitation from our environmental officer to participate in a meeting at the Carver's Creek Solar Farm last week. Um, involved were the contractor who's building the facility the company that's doing the compliance for the environmental standards and our environmental officer. And uh, it was it was like a two and a half hour uh, visit of the entire facility. Um, it's really interesting how big that is. And uh, they're about a third of the way through there. I think they've got 50 megawatts currently in operation with another 100 to come online in the next year. Uh, some interesting factoids, I had no idea that the people that work on these solar farms, they're a very elite group of people that move from solar farm to solar farm. They're from all over the country. As a matter of fact, there were some people that were from Florida that had to leave pretty quickly because of their families in Florida. But uh, there are several hundred people working at any one time, and these are well-paid jobs and uh, doing a great job. And the other is, you know, we talked about data centers. I didn't realize this, how much energy a data center uses. So. The 50 megawatts that they're producing now probably might fuel one reasonably decent sized data center and more and more are coming online. So we started talking about just how much energy this country is going to need for all these data centers that are popping up everywhere. It's phenomenal. But it was a great meeting. Uh, they're moving forward. Uh, uh, the compliance group that is, was hired, you know, they're being paid by the company. We pay them and then we get reimbursed for the money. Uh, they're doing a great job in making sure that they follow all the rules and regulations given some of the initial issues that we heard from some of our constituents. So, yeah, things are moving along really well. And uh, it was, I w you know, maybe sometime when it's halfway through or whatever, we can get everyone up there to look at it. But it's, it's impressive. It's really impressive. Just, and plus, while I was there, you could see that these panels are computer controlled. So while we were there, 
every 15 minutes they moved slightly so that they got the full vertical uh, horizontal or vertical uh, aspects of the sun. So yeah, it was it was it was a great meeting. Thank you. All right, we'll move to county administrator items. I just have one item, and that's an apology that I have not gotten the weekly report out to you yet. I've still been working on, so it's going to be probably a combination thing, but I will tell you that there will be some good news coming on the, the testing results um, out at the reservoir, so uh, make you wait for it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we'll move to scheduled presentations. Open broadband update. Eric Beach, Chief Information Officer, and Kent Winrich. Chief Technology Officer, Open Broadband. Uh, can't, can't be here tonight, but uh, Greg has come as their representative. And I have a small slideshow here. While that's coming up, I'll just mention the reason that they're not here is because of the issues with the storm in, in Carolina, in both of them. So. I mean, I kind of want to not just open broadband, but broadband in general as an update for the county. Um, and I wanted to go back in history just a little bit um, you can go to the next slide. I uh, wanted to just address the RDOF um, program that was a few years back with Cox. Um, we had a conversation with them about a week ago uh, just to see where they were on that, and they did actually complete it uh, to bring broadband to about 37 homes off Featherbed Lane. And according to Cox, they have three customers that actually signed up for it which is, I guess, surprising, but um, that's what they said their take was on that. Um, next slide, Whitney, thanks. Um, regarding VADI and ARPA, um, which is the fixed wireless program, um, we've got a list here of what, where we are. We've got the Main Street Water Tower, which is a backhaul for the, the whole uh, wireless system there uh, it's up and fully configured the page water tower is up and fully configured as well uh, and we'll have customers who can actually sign up off of the signal from that tower that has a 360 degree view of the area we have the point water tower that is up as well but it is not connected to verizon yet so the equipment is on the top of the tower ready to go but open broadband is having quite a fight with verizon to go ahead and get that connection and that circuit up and running. Uh, we have the landfill tower. Uh, that's up and fully configured and running. Uh, James Store, uh, which is the north tower, is also up and it's been up for a while just like the landfill has. We are suggesting to open broadband to move to a 270 degree configuration right now. I think it's only uh, 90, um, but at 270 degrees so we can come back around and get Rang Tang and Burke View in those areas where there are quite a few residents who could be served uh, probably fairly inexpensively by getting that uh, tower to have a view of the back of that. We've got uh, Achilles Elementary. That is no longer viable. That was going to be one of our 150 foot towers to serve that area. Uh, the school system no longer wants that in that school in the back. So we are now looking for uh, property. Brenton Becky what's, what's, is what's the, reason for, for that? Uh, the school board does not not the school board necessarily but the school system does not want that tower in the play area of of the playground there they have two soccer fields in the back corner that they just don't want the tower above that area originally it was um, before the planning board it was approved um, but the school has pushed back on it One more thing about it, what's, what's happened is we had located the tower very close to the property line, so they could still have the soccer fields and such, but our ordinances require that the fall zone be within, within our property. So we went out and did the actual site plan. We had to move it into next to the soccer field. So it basically sits right behind the school where if it fell, it would land anywhere on their property. So it kind of pushed it from the edge back into the middle of behind the school. It just doesn't work out with all the activities they have out back for us to put the tower right in the middle of where the kids play. Um, Brenton Becky, uh, that tower is still planned to be built. Uh, Bethel Peasley, uh, w we've discussed that here a few times uh, because of the appearance of it right on the road there. Uh, the church, Bethel Church, 
did not want or fought to have that removed, which it was right in their line of sight, so we pulled back on that. Uh, we do have a Verizon monopole in that area, uh, which Open Broadband has worked with Verizon a bit on that, uh, but may be cost prohibitive as to how many customers could actually sign up there because it is a monthly fee to be on the Verizon poll. Uh, the Harcum location is still TBD. That's uh, still planned on being built there. Um, since the Page Water Tower came online uh, as of 9-12, uh, about 15 days ago, uh, there are no new customers who have signed up yet. Um, we do have signal issues that uh, were not, the signals are not as strong and not traveling at the distance that we thought they were going to. Um, and we've studied a little bit and found that we have, again, the Harcum Tower, Achilles, Brenton Becky's need to go up, but we could probably do well with one near Fig Shop. That would serve about 324, about 15% of the unserved in the area. And uh, we also need one out at uh, Sign Pine. That's the name of it, Sign Pine. There's another one that could cover quite a few residents. Um, next slide, please. Question, could I say? Yeah. We're, I'm sorry. No worries. Uh, we're, when you were mentioning, you said the Bethel Peasley Pole, Can you, not, you mean tower or pole? Or? Uh, the Bethel Peasley Tower, uh, which was going to be on the a school. Verizon pole, I'm sorry. There is a Verizon monopole that sits back. Not the tower. Correct. Correct. It, it is a type of tower. Where our pole, where our towers go up from a base and then narrow and go up, the Verizon monopole is a very tall, just round pole that goes straight up. Okay. So it's not the tower we were talking about earlier. Wasn't it a tower there? No, we were going to have a tower there on the Bethel Peasley no, 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 School. No, I mean the tower, the Verizon Tower. That's the, the monopole. That's the monopole. Yes, sir. And we've been how long trying to get that? Yes, we, they've an been working. From Verizon. Yes, that's they've been, been working on that one. Now. They have. Yes. That's well, how many people will the paid site reach? Uh, Potentially, probably 70, 75, something like that. It's not a huge number, but it's part of the, the plan that we laid out with the county originally. Um, you know, it, that's not to say that something couldn't change. I mean, if the county decided that that wasn't a place that they felt that the investment was worth, the equipment could be moved. But that's something we'd have to have a discussion at a different, uh, different level. One of the neighborhoods we were hoping to be able to pull off of the page site was Carter Cove, and we have not been able to reach that. So how much longer do you think it'll take before we can get an answer from Verizon? We have an answer. I mean, please. We have me. an answer, and I, and I think that's, there's two, two factors, and one is open broadband, and the other is the county, because the county had uh, agreed that we would take care of that monthly fee. So that was something because we were the ones moving it. So they're not asked for that, but even looking at twenty to $30,000 for the design, you have to have, and then they've been reluctant, even when they're willing to pay them. But understanding now, just like the Page Tower was supposed to be a major hub under the first design, but now understanding the limitation of the signal because of all the trees, it's no longer a big hub, and the Verizon Tower probably isn't financially worth it with the percentages of rates, of sign-up rates, too. So it's not just reaching, but even when you reach, like, you know, Mr. Beach said, as far as, you know, 37 new homes getting uh, Cox available to them from a federal grant that they would have never gotten had it not been for that federal grant, and only three signed up. And that take rates not, are very low. Yeah, not to steal um, Eric's thunder. That's actually what we're hearing from most ISPs. The take rate is on the first pass, the first year or so, it's about 10%. So that's right in line with what uh, Cox found. So it's a, sort of a, 
I don't want to call it an oxymoron, but it, it still baffles me when you hear about all of the people who complain about not having broadband, and yet when the opportunity is there, a lot of them still don't take it. So, sorry, didn't mean to. No, no, you're exactly right. All right. Any uh, any other questions regarding ARPA and the and the towers? Okay. Um, I'd like to go over the Vadi project and the funding and the results that we have on Vadi. Um, as you know, that was a project to uh, facilitate access for about 133 passings or homes for us in Gloucester and 131 in Matthews. Um, as of today, we have five takes from the Gloucester, which is about a 4% take rate, and Matthews has a 26% take rate at 34. And are, that, these these Vadi, these are not wireless, are they? They, they are, are wireless. They are wireless. They are, are they're all wireless. Yes. Okay. And we can uh, go over the numbers in detail if that's what you would like to do, Mr. Chair. Mr. Isn't it ironic that you know for all the good folks out there that wanted this, when you, you give it to them and they don't take it, uh, is it is it an economic thing you think, or is it a financial issue, or? What do you think is preventing them from taking it? You know, uh, honestly, I don't know that. Well, yeah, I mean, I, honestly, I don't know that everybody wants it. If, if I can, I, I think. Can we do this for nothing? No, 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 I, no, no I think no. what's happened is that the cell service, we've had three new towers go up in Gloucester County. We still have areas that have very poor cell service, but many people, starting with the pandemic, became completely dependent upon the internet and they're using it and they're using it effectively with their cell service. And so when they're already paying a monthly bill and they've got unlimited data and when, if you think about, is it about 80% I think is the percentage now of people who are, everything they're doing, they're doing on their phone versus the laptop or versus a, a regular old PC. And obviously you can plug this into your TV and and watch whatever you want in streaming that way too. So I think the technology has changed during the time that we've been working on this project. All right. And, and if I can, I, I, I promise I've tried not to, to, um, no, to speak, but I think we, we, there's just a couple of facts that this is very important for the board to understand. Um, because of the lack of being able to reach everyone in Gloucester, um, then we are not gonna be reimbursed fully from the state. So we are currently closing out the grant because we've done all that can be done. We have all agreed upon which passes the people can reach and, and which cannot. And we do have the funds in the budget. Ms. Callaway has been a part of this as a fiscal agent um, from the whole grant time period. So I, I do want you to know the money is covered, but unfortunately, about $52,000 in expected grant money will not be coming to the county. Mr. Pisani. So given the significant capacity that we're looking at here, is Gloucester County going to be looking, holding the bag for the expenses for this going forward since no one's taking it up? I mean, where, where does the county uh, stop bleeding from this? You have two projects, this one and the ARPA, and the ARPA is funded through the ARPA grant, well, I mean, the ARPA out. funds, that and out. that's just capital, and then it's on the company to go from there. And this one, again, the same thing, the operation goes back to the company. So the the county's only responsibility that's out there now is not being reimbursed fully for VADI. And there's risk in any of these things that, a, you know, any company could say we're not making enough money and we would have spent money and they'd go away. But every indication we have is that they want this to be successful and they've got a lot of money, not just the county's money, but a lot of money to open broadband is put in. So they're not trying to close the doors. But we, so, we don't have any, any others that I'm aware of. Mr. Gibson. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so thank, thank you for the presentation. I know you're not done, but I just have a preliminary question 
about, uh, you, you've mentioned the term body acronym. And just for the public's benefit, can you explain what that is? <laughs> that would be the one I don't fully know. It's a Virginia Telecommunications yeah. Virginia Telecommunications Initiative, which was set out by the department, um, the DHCD in Virginia, to fund internet and broadband for unserved individuals. And we, that was our area up in the north that we applied for the grant for. And if my recollection is correct, uh, the target was somewhere approximately 145 homes in Gloucester County, is that correct? 133. 133. And so you've contact, so you've, have you contacted, has the company contacted all of these homes? We have attempted contact on, I, I don't have an actual number, but uh, well in excess of 100. Um, I've handed, I mean, I've put door hangers on uh, so many in that area. We've gone knocking on doors. We've done mailers. Um, yeah, and I've gone out with open broadband myself and Many of these homes have no trespassing signs at the very beginning of a very long driveway. Um, so there's no ability for us to actually go out there. So the, the plan from our telecommunications committee um, that we have, well, we have a subgroup that's the grant committee as well as the, the um, full committee, is that after tonight and after everything was sort of you know publicly announced and we're, uh, we know the, the step forward with the state people, that we, the county, is gonna send a letter, and that way it's coming from us, not from open broadband, that says, we tried to contact you, and uh, they're you know, not successful. If you are interested in more information or having a survey of your site, please contact, and it will, they'll contact us, and that way we're able to track if there's any question about who's not getting, because if sometimes when people get things that are, they might consider junk mail. Hopefully they'll open it. Um, and then secondly, just like Mr. Beach said, there are a number of no trespassing signs and you all know we're not allowed to go on those properties. So the separate letter says, we weren't even able to get on your property and look at it at all. Do you want somebody to come? So both of those, um, you know, Whitney's had it ready to go out. We've been just waiting and um, the only thing that we did think about was because of the, uh, Ms. Cronin being out, and I just remembered this, that maybe we would want to wait till she comes back in because if a bunch of phone calls start coming in, it might be a little bit hard on our office. Mr. Bazan. So <clears throat> right now, Gloucester has a 4% take rate. Let, let's assume that we get up to 25%, let's say. Um, I still ask the question, what happens with the additional capacity? Who, who funds that? Who funds that additional capacity? Are we... Like, like we had the utility system, are we paying for that? No, the capacity, the capacity to take on those new customers is there. The capacity to take on 133 is there. Um, it's but just who pays for the unpaid capacity? You guys, open broadband. Yep. You guys absorb that. Yes, sir. Okay. Also, with the grant, they're required. Um, there's a three-year follow-up on the closing of this, so they have the equipment that goes in the house and goes on the house for these people. Had they um, taken. We estimated, I think it was a 50 or a 60 percent take rate, being very optimistic. So the equipment's in storage over on Carriage Court. So that's already been purchased, and if more people join up, they have it to connect them. So right now, we're at roughly $17,538 per site, per house. Which is still less than Cox for many houses that are 30 to 50 to even 200,000 per house. And that's why they're not funded. Yeah, you're talking about these houses that for Cox would have to lay cable, the cost to get right. to the house. That's right. what you're saying. It, it, I'm, the average that we asked for uh, or that we stated in the grant application, I think was around 4,500. I mean, it was not, I mean, it's still expensive. Um, and Mr. Reed may know, but I would say it's probably in the four to ten thousand dollars for many of the places um, with many of the grant applications. And what you're going to see next when he continues with the presentation is a cost that we don't have per house, but it's going to be back up in that much higher 
but it will not be on the county's responsibility. Mr. Bazan. So my concern is, and, and you guys, you know, you're, you're a business, and, um, and even if we get up to 25%, I don't think that's financially sustainable for your company, is it? Because you might just say, this is an unusable market, and we're just going to shut down. Well, a business decision that you may have to make here. Right. I, I don't want to speak for the CEO who, unfortunately, uh, with his regrets, couldn't make it tonight because of the circumstances uh, in Carolina. Oh, sorry. Uh, again, don't don't want to speak for the company officials who make those grill decisions, but um, there's no indication we're we're committed to this. We want to find a way to do it. We're exploring some other options that might not be directly fixed wireless, but these would be more long-term and potentially under the next round of, of financing that's coming along. Um, there are houses up in the Vadi area that can get our reception and can get very well that have just said no. So, I mean, the, the sometimes it's because, uh, for instance, one house has already signed a two-year agreement with uh, HughesNet. So they didn't want to do anything. They might do something when that expires. Um, another house I probably l laid or put under or put on a door, four or five of my door hangers, never got a response. Finally found a number, a phone number in a, a 2,500 <laughs> person sign up sheet and called and not going to speak any names or anything, but it was the estranged husband who said, oh yeah, I'm not there anymore, I will let her know that she can get internet, um, and still nothing. So I mean, there are just a lot of different reasons why people choose not to do it. Um, Eric will tell you, there was one lady that we mistakenly went down a driveway, neither one of us saw the no trespassing sign, and we got down and spoke to her, and she said, when we told her why we were there, she said, I don't even like the fact that your radio signals can come across my property, leave. <laughs> and we did, of course, it wasn't, wasn't any heartache or anything on that. But there are a myriad of reasons why people don't, don't take the service, even when they can get it. All right, oh, one more slide. All right, this is gonna be a discussion on Gloucester Bead program, Broadband Equity Access and Deployment. And this is a program that's coming out from the state that involves federal funds that came out to, the ultimate goal is to provide every citizen in the United States with broadband access. Virginia is one of the leading states uh, in the country to do this. They're the first ones that got approval from the FCC and the plan there is that they actually partner with the vendor themselves. There are no funds that come from any county or city. Uh, what will happen is that there are matching funds involved, but that the vendor takes on that cost. That program, uh, actually today, was the first um, day for the, let's see, I'm headed here, I apologize. The intent window, and that intent window is, 60 to 90 days where Cox, Verizon, other vendors can come out and say, we intend to uh, make a plan for a certain area of the county or the city that they want to uh, expand into. The ultimate goal for Virginia is to have any of those plans that come out, they have a five month window to produce the plan, get it approved, and they want everything done by 2028. So the, the unfortunate part about that is it's, we're probably three to four years away from the broadband being brought to those areas, uh, but it, the good part is it's no expense to the county at all or the citizens of the county. But it's another, another good wait. Uh, this will not be wireless. The first round will be fiber uh, and wireless. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's actually the third take uh, when they go around that they can bring wireless back into the fold there and the wireless companies can now say, okay, then we, we'll try to cover it with the same program, type of program. And Mr. Beach and I met with both Cox and Verizon and they, especially Verizon, has indicated they want to bring fiber to Gloucester. You know, we didn't have 
the Fios that they had across the, uh, the county, across the river, I mean. And uh, they've been talking to Matthews, they've been talking to us. They may come in and it's done by an area not, it's similar to a zip code, so they will set those things, but we've, uh, and Eric's staying in contact with them. I, I think that that's gonna probably happen. And from all that I've read, there is, you cannot, they have to reach 95% of the area that they sign up for in the grant. That's the minimum. And then they get more points if they go up to 100%. It is not probable that some of the homes, not only here, but all over the place that are very remote, that those homes will ever be served by fiber. And so they've recognized nationally and statewide that fixed wireless is still going to be needed, which means you have to have all the infrastructure to be able to reach those very far remote locations. Mr. Brazil. So, um, you know, it's every two months I get a bill from Cox and every time I get a bill from them, they seem to want to increase their rates. Uh, you have to consistently negotiate with them. So I looked at, I looked at um, Starlink, uh, Elon Musk's Starlink program. We are covered here in Gloucester County by that. We are covered. So I'm wondering if the impact of Starlink competing against you good folks makes this whole project well, the, mix. Well, I will say that the Starlink system is more expensive up front. It's two to $300 in equipment, and the minimum price is $120 a month, which is considerably more than open broadband has been charging. Okay. They also have not been able to reach, uh, not been able to reach. They may have our area covered, but they are not responding. I think it's just not having enough satellite, not having enough people, mm -hmm. whatever, but like the county's never been. We signed up to be one of the experiment groups and I don't think we've ever even been given the opportunity. But we do know, we've talked to customers in the county who have it and they like it very much. So that's another option for people. Are they limited because it's a satellite to structures that have a full view of the satellites? Because obviously the same issue that you guys have is trees, are, are, are trees and interfering with the satellite signal, which is the same thing for all these people at DISH or whatever. You've got to have a clear path around the house for that signal. And I know, for example, while my house is served by, f by fiber, you know, we are completely surrounded by trees that the likelihood of us ever, ever having uh, fixed wireless would have been impossible had we not had that. So I don't think my house is unusual, especially in many of the very rural areas of this county. Starlink is much like DISH network. Uh, you don't have to have a full view, but you would have to have a certain angle toward a certain southwest uh, parameter that would allow you to see the satellites as they go over. And I, I do want to add uh, a, another thing that ha we have had a little bit of success on is called LeCap, which is the Line Extension Customer um, Assistance Program. And what that does, and a lot of people have been frustrated is that Cox will run right by their driveway, but because their driveway is over 250 feet long, they, they're not being served. Um, I did put a, a family onto Lee Cap uh, not too long ago, and they got a call back and were approved within a two days. Uh, and what I'm hearing from the state is that they did have a income restriction on that, um, but they're kind of waiving that at this point um, because of the need of that program and how long people's driveways are. So if you have a constituent that is struggling with that, please let them call me and, or you know, give them my number and I will gladly put them onto that program. It's also listed on our broadband website page. So then send no, so how, I mean, how is it funded? It's, it's a state grant? It's a state, it's a state grant and they pay Cox to. Oh, they pay Cox to. To extend it, yes. Okay. It's not something that we get involved in at all. No, I think we're, are there any more slides? No, sir. I was. <laughs> okay, uh, I have some questions. Um, first, first of all, for you, Mr. Beachman, thank you for your presentation. Uh, regarding the bead program 
Uh, I, I did some research on that today. Looks like in 2021, uh, Congress passed a $42.5 billion appropriation to fund rural broadband. And to date, three years later, not one person has been connected. That's correct. Not one person. And it is shocking to me, and I found it interesting, I uh, hope you don't mind, uh, Mr. Wilmot, but he mentioned that he'd been recently been to the Empire State Building. And I recently saw uh, I, a factoid uh, that the Empire State Building was built in 1930 in one year and 45 days. 102 stories, one of the tallest buildings in the world. One year and 45 days. And then you, you mentioned this timeline of four to five years from now, and I know it's not your fault, but we, we fought and defeated two global powers in World War II in four years. <laughs> and we can't provide internet yeah. to our unserved population. It is just mind-boggling that we have this massive sum of money and we can't be organized enough to serve these areas. And my district, as I'm sure you've heard before, the Petsworth District, they are un unserved, they are rural, and I have, from the minute I've gotten elected, I have gotten call after call after email after email saying, when is this going to happen? Why don't I hear any updates? What can you do? And I am doing my best to try to do what I can to push this forward because uh, without this service, it affects their property values. People have a hard time selling their home. People don't want to buy a home that doesn't have reliable internet access. It hurts our economic ability. It hurts people who want to homeschool or who want to go to school remotely. It affects their entire quality of life. And in Petsworth, you can't always get reliable cell reception. So that is not always an option, and so people have to do what they can. But I'm just shocked at the delay that it takes to implement this. Uh, but just, just for my own, for the county's benefit, for my district's benefit, I just want to make sure I understand the facts here of, of where we are. And as I understand it, uh, this funding, $2 million of ARPA funding, was approved in 2021 to fund and to pay open broadband, the company, to implement fixed wireless in the county. Is that accurate? 2021. That was before my time. I just want to confirm that. But yes. Yeah. Okay. And three years ago, that's three years ago. Now, it, according to, to my research, that we, it was appropriated in September 21, so three years ago. How much money has open broadband received from Gloucester County? The, if, do you want me to answer that? Or, and, yeah. and Maria is here, too, if I speak out a turn. But the total project was uh, 3.1 when you look at capital and ARPA money, because we had already set aside capital for broadband when the ARPA money came around. So approximately $2 million, which has purchased the four towers that have not been put in the ground. They are still, you know, the manufacturer made them, all that. Um, all of the equipment that is sitting in the trailers over there. At the time that the board approved this, there was a, a real rush try to get as much of the equipment as we could um, with open broadband because of the supply issues. You remember there was a chip shortage and things like that. So they purchased everything. There's no doubt that the county has every right to be to feel very disappointed in how long it has taken in it, um, with the deployment of the expenses that we have paid. And we have not paid them anything for a couple of years now, even though they have a full-time employee in the county and still working on them. So the equipment's been purchased. The labor, the, you know, the, the permitting, those things have all been done. But my specific question there. is how much has the county it, paid about, open it's a, broadband? It's about $2 million, um, for borrowed, this plus. Borrowed. Oh, that's all ARPA. And ARPA and capital. And how much it, capital? The whole project together was 3.1, and maybe let Maria answer Ms. it specifically. Ms. Tyler, can you go back to Sally? Yeah, go ahead. 
Well, you also have to add the body numbers on there, too. That's and I, I apologize. I'm reading this off of my spreadsheet on my phone. Um, <clears throat> based on my records, Open Broadband has received $2,224,000 of ARPA funding from the county. And I have the others. And I'm, Mr. There's about 600 and some odd thousand that is sitting in the bank that has not been spent on the project. So, Mr. Reed. That's the money that came out of our account, right? 382 and 42. According to the slide from Mr. Beach, we have a total of five homes in Gloucester County connected to open broadband. Is that correct? Body but homes in Gloucester County. Are there any other, other than those five homes, connected to your company's service in, in Gloucester County? Yes, there are. So for an investment of $2,224,000 for five homes, no, that equates. What is the number? The total? 16. 16. 16. Oh, 16. All right. So much that messes up your numbers, Ken. It's still high. So we paid $140,000 per home to connect 16 homes. And I understand not everybody wants the service for whatever reason, but that, that, that's a, a disappointing number. Uh, for, when when this, was, this contract was entered, I believe the numbers were 14% of our county was unserved with broadband. They didn't have broadband available, which equates to 2,500 residents, most of whom live in the Petsworth district. And almost three years later, of those 2,500 residents, we have 16 homes that have no, but that, that have service, um, and the remainder apparently do not. And I looked on Open Broadband's website today, and you, just, you serve four different states, and you state on your web page, Open Broadband provides hybrid fiber and fixed wireless ISP solutions to bring fast and reliable broadband internet to your community. Compared to fiber or cable, fixed wireless is much faster to deploy. Here we are three years later. Are, are, do you think that, that this has been a fast deployment? No, but that would statement might also be applied to any of the ISPs that are putting in fiber as well, in that it's not fast for them, it's not necessarily as long for us when they're, yeah, I'm sorry, I forget about the mic. Um, it, it, it shouldn't take as long for us, you're, you're right. But there are also obstacles as you go along that you find. And the obstacles that you've previously mentioned are you didn't have the right equipment, correct? That was one, yeah. And in your website, you state, each technology and piece of equipment is carefully selected to deliver the best quality and speed possible. Why wasn't the correct equipment purchased for our county? Well, the equipment that was purchased at the time with the grant money was what we had researched to be the best at the time. Now, since then, this product that we're now using from Tirana has been developed. And so we took down the equipment from internationally known Nokia, took it off of the landfill tower, took it off of the um, North, Tower. North Tower, as well as we had one on top of the, the water tower here. We took that down, and at our expense, we put back up the Tirana equipment, which has performed much better than the Nokia, both in overall speed and not significantly better reach, but better reach and then better connectivity, staying connected. The second explanation you provided for the delay in our previous meetings is the foliage and the terrain are not suitable for broader coverage. And what I can't understand is you serve four different states, four very somewhat different states, uh, North Carolina, Virginia, Florida, what's the fourth state, Georgia? You serve Georgia? Uh, a little South bit of Georgia, Carolina. a little bit of Alabama. Okay, so very different topography in different parts of the state. I mean, uh, Virginia, of course, has mountainous regions, flat regions. So you, I'm, I'm sure you have experience in dealing with different topography and foliage. So if 
if, if the topography and the foliage of Gloucester County was not suitable for this service, why wasn't the due diligence done to advise us that your service is just not suitable for our county? I, why, why weren't we advised of this before you entered this contract? I, I would say, and this predates my time here, I would say that the industry's experts that we consulted uh, told us that the equipment, the Nokia equipment, was going to work for this purpose. So since then, as we stated earlier, we've removed that equipment and, and gone with uh, the newer technology. It still is not possible to penetrate everything. And we run into this, other companies run into this in other areas of the country. And, and to your question about uh, topography and, and density, no two places are the same, but people that we have brought in, and I have ridden around with providers of the fixed wireless receivers that you put on people's homes, um, and in particular, oh, I can't remember the name of it, Be uh, Bellevue, is that right? Yeah, I think it's Bellevue, um, and I think it's in your district. Um, I took him for a ride down there, and, and we didn't go very far before he said, wow, the only thing that's going to reach here is a tall pole and fiber. Will the new technologies that you're employing uh, overcome the terrain and foliage in Gloucester County? Not 100% unless we can get other vertical as uh, assets closer to the homes. Are you committed only to providing service to the 133 body homes or to provide service to all unserved homes in Gloucester County? Well, we're moving south, and this sort of spoils, and, and Eric already uh, sort of spoiled some of my slideshow, but we'll move right into what we're talking about. We, we've already started moving south in the county with Page and uh, Gloucester Point, um, Verizon. But those areas are served by Cox. We, we need service in the northern part of the county. Right, but you asked about ARPA, and that's where the ARPA funding was in the agreement that we apparently signed originally for the layout of the county. Again, predates my time here. But um, so we're following the uh, statement of work that was agreed upon originally. Um, we're also talking amongst um, some other members here, this, this group, as well as our CTO, CFO, and um, somebody that you've contracted with, um, Tyler, yeah about potentially having other sites here in the county. But you know, we're looking at what those things would cover, but there's been no agreements and no, no decisions made on anything. That's a, a longer story. Okay. So, so is the answer yes, you're going to attempt to serve all unserved homes or no? I think it's going to really depend on what the county wants us to do. The, uh, if I can, the, the contract is for them to serve yes. all unserved. The question is, how much is the technology going to work with this? And when he was talking about the, the, the towers, if the signal is there and if it could be more expensive, but it can hop from tower to tower and still get there. Um, I, I do want to point out that when we talk about that percentage, while there is a lot of concentration of, of unserved people in the northern part of the county, there's quite a few. It almost does like the perimeter of the county because people along the water, so that 2,500 goes all the way down, and that's why we did a tower sequence that included Gloucester Point and other, and the, and the Page Tower. And, and last question. Uh, what, if any effort, other than uh, putting flyers or, or door hangers, um, are you making to communicate with potential customers uh, about your service because as I mentioned in a previous meeting I signed up in 2021 right when I heard the news because I had no viable internet solution where I live and I have never received any communication whatsoever I believe one of your representatives called me but that's probably because I'm on the board of supervisors that, that representative and, and, and would be I me. should not receive special treatment simply because I'm in this position I, I, I would hope that you would reach out and call anybody interested in your service, but I've never received uh, an, an email, uh, mail communication. I have never seen any advertising 
any social media advertising, and I just can't understand if you're trying to expand your service and you certainly have the funds to engage in a marketing campaign that you're not doing that. Can't speak to what the marketing folks have decided or not decided, but uh, I was the, the representative who contacted you, and I went out into your area there in the fields as they enter into that larger home uh, group in the back and wasn't able to get a signal out there as, as I communicated back to you. And I have spoken to other members. As a matter of fact, I was on the f uh, emailing with somebody the road right that turns off a feather, but I can't remember the name of it today. I'm going to say his last name was Hoffman or Huffman, um, about a signal there as well. And right now, we don't have coverage in that area. Potentially, we've talked about um, locating something in a future plan off of the towers there near the Zoll Winery. In a, I guess that's Soles, the area of the county, um, that would probably provide coverage into that area. Um, but again, th these are next uh, steps. I, I didn't ask about coverage. I asked about your marketing efforts. What, what marketing efforts are you making? Well, right now we've got a mailer going out into the page geographic area as well as uh, Facebook coverage in that area coming out later in the week. And we had an email, uh, targeted email, go out to um, various areas of the county where we should be able to get some coverage. but. What I tried to do is go through and parse through the list of people that had signed up over the last several years and not send it to people where we can't get coverage because I don't see any reason to create any more irritation uh, for people. And unfortunately, the gentleman who called today was one I did not catch when I parsed that list. We have offered him a potential cell solution. Uh, I'm not sure that he's, he's going to be interested in it because it does have quite a bit of price it's almost like a Starlink kind of price to get started. Dr. Orr. You mentioned that we now have in storage four towers, correct? They're at the manufacturers. So they, I think it's in Georgia or someplace in the South that made yes, them. It's in, it's so we have a lot of equipment that has been purchased with the funds. So, you know, if we've talked about some of these worst case scenarios that we want to stay out of court, we want to get the people the broadband if we can, but that equipment could be confiscated, you know, or we could go back for, if we had to somehow, I'm not, I don't want to get into the law part of it, but we have, there is equipment there that's been purchased that will be hopefully put to use and then areas like that we're talking about, eventually they will get coverage. How, how many, how, if we've paid for it, why would we lose it? We, well, I'm, I'm not saying, I'm saying we have collateral. That's what I'm saying, exactly. Even though the money has been paid to them, we still have the equipment. Why is it? They, they, because the signal was not working there at the, at the landfill. Thanks, so but that goes it, back to Mr. Gibson's question about due diligence and looking at before you even purchase the first piece of equipment, say, is this going to work? What, what equipment will work? And did they know about the topography before they got into this thing? It's like the federal government bought you know, trillions of dollars worth of infrastructure law to put up charging stations in the United States, and only eight of them went up. So <laughs> we're in the same situation. People are reluctant. Ford's getting out of the EV business. Now we've got folks in this good county <coughs> that, you know, even though they've got the service, they're not wanting to hook up to it. So what are we doing? So what, what's, the, what's the end game here? Well, two, of the we, towers can I, not, two of the towers have not gone up because they were shut down by the place that they were going to be. So we have to find new places for those towers that actually allow us to connect the signal. The original plan and the way the towers were laid out was so that the towers would cover all of the areas. With Bethel Peasley and Achilles now out of the game, we have to find new locations that still facilitate that signal traveling throughout the county. That's part of the holdup. Uh, we do have a study that by Tyler Biku, who worked with Matthews on the body program of where we can put a tower that would satisfy the most customers and we can get the most bang for the buck. One of those being Fig Shop, which I think would uh, cover Mr. Gibson's area better. Uh, I don't know exactly where you live. But we need the, additional property that we don't have. Right. So if the, the Bethel, county owned it, we would yeah. have these up there. So the Bethel Peasley property, there's that large, vast area that I think 
is used by teams playing soccer, whatever. There's no way to put, are we being prevented by putting a tower anywhere in that area because of the church? Are they, they're the objection? Their, their request and the board agreed to that, that to not block the church's view in the historic church. You also um, have, sorry, you also have some uh, wetlands area there. You have low area there so that, that does not facilitate the tower going anywhere on that piece of property. The place that it was originally put was the highest point. And so if you go back behind the school, you're into uh, a marsh area and wetlands, and then you're over to the fire department, which is also a low area. If, if I can refresh the board's memory too of when we started in this whole process, we started with Cox and the cost was prohibitive. There have been other localities that have beat us at this game because they put 10 and $20 million out of local tax dollars and they subsidized the companies and they got their fiber. We were not looking at doing that and that only left us the option of going fixed wireless. When we did a fixed wireless study, it was not with open broadband. We hired a professor who has a company out of Virginia Tech who did a survey and showed how it would work and we used that with our RFP. We got zero responses. After that time, I went back to the state. The state said there's this other company, you might want to contact them. Because it had already been put out in the RFP and it had been fully advertised, we were allowed to contact them and said, would you like to? And they had not heard about the RFP. So they came in, the person who I worked with at the time is no longer with the company, but they did another review of that plan. And Unfortunately, and I mean, it's ter terribly disappointing and very costly for time and money, the technology is not working like the very first study said or the second. We would, we would have signal coming off of that landfill tower that would have reached all the way and then the last bit would have come from the Harcum site. So it, it has not worked. But I, I did want you to know that it was something that was studied by other people in the, in the field. So two studies said that it would not work? No, it would, it would work, but it has not worked. No, the, the, okay. it would I work. I misunderstood you. I'm, I'm sorry. We are not the only county in Virginia who is struggling with wireless. Uh, it, it, it's across the state. Um, it, is not, it has not performed like it was said it would. So, so getting back to the polls, so we had polls identified for the Bethel Peasley and the Achilles site, correct? Right. So those polls are just sitting. And the, and the Brent and Becky's and the Harcum Fire Department. Okay, so what we're looking for now are additional sites that- Better have, locations. Better locations, and you just can't say to someone, can we bar, use your property? It's gotta be an appropriate site so that the transmission from one tower to the other is effective. You right. can't just put it anywhere. So, right. so you what have people, fall zones and other. So you've got to, you've and got it has a, to you've go to the a, BZA. A, yeah, you've got a radius of those sites that have to overlap a little bit, right. correct? So right. that you, your signals from one to the other, and if you don't, it's, it doesn't pay to put this tower, correct? Exactly, and you don't want to go try to put a tower up and have the same problem we've had at the landfill. So we've been working together, and we brought in this additional consultant who is sort of verifying what open broadband says so that we know that we're making sure that it's the truth, but they're also working together to help one another and looking at the mapping system, which I'm not sure if, if I think you referenced that you might have slides. I'm not sure if you do, Greg, or not, but you can literally look and test and you can see these heat maps of where, if we, what if we put a tower here? So we don't own very much property. So the first place we looked is our convenience centers. They already have electricity. We own them even though waste management. Unfortunately, as we've tested them, you might get 10 homes. When you put up a tower, you put all the equipment up, it's not worth it. And out of those 10 homes, you may only get two people apply. So it is now this study of where can we find either willing landowners, and it's, again, there's a, you have to go through the Board of Zoning Appeals to put these up. Um, so it's a cost from surveying and engineering, all those things. And I, I think it's eventually going to come together, but I also think it, um, 
we will still be looking at the fiber route, and that will work better in many locations. Why, why was Matthews having a higher tag rate? I mean, you had 30, 26% versus four. Is there any reason? Well, to Mr. Gibson's uh, point earlier, some topography. Um, this particular technology from Tirana, the way it gathers signal and beam forming and stuff that's way over my head, it loves the river and we're shooting right down the North River. So we get very good coverage throughout that area all the way to the tip of uh, an area called Roy's Point, which is right at the top of the Mob Jack Bay. And I have installed customers all the way down there. Um, we actually get some bleed over. Carol doesn't like me to mention, but there is some bleed over across the North River um, that we've picked up a few customers along um, the Gloucester side as well. Uh, and it really just has to do, again, with, with what radio waves do around different objects. So. Chair, okay. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Mr. Coach. All right, so I've got just a couple of things for my own clarification. All right, number one, most people aren't going to react or sign up until the possibility of something bad taking place, like another COVID event, okay? So my question to you guys is, if that's the case, God forbid, if that's the case, how many houses, how many locations or whatever word you use, how many can you successfully serve in the event that people start calling and saying, hey, we, we know you got broadband in this situation and we need internet and we need it now. How many houses can we successfully serve? Uh, are you talking about uh, based on the capacity of the current equipment? Based on the capacity of the current equipment. If, if I believe, and it's going to vary depending upon people's usage, because it's a total bandwidth is how the, the system operates. But since people typically don't use a high level all the time, you get sort of a burst thing. Uh, you're probably looking at several hundred per transmission unit, or what we call BNs, or broadcast nodes on the Tiranas. Uh, and right now we have, what, one, two, three, four, five, six that are up in the county. How many could you actually reach? How many could you actually reach? Yeah, well, see, that's the other question. How many houses could we actually reach is a question that you're never going to know until you get down on the ground and put your test meter. Because the heat maps, where they show that we're hitting these areas, when you get on the ground and put the equipment up to actually test, as Eric and I found out, it doesn't always give you a signal that will give them a, uh, an internet signal that meets the requirements, whether it's the 25.3 of, of VADI or the 120 of BEAD. Um, so we can sometimes install people at less than those numbers, but it wouldn't fit the requirements of the grants that we have been given. So to Mr. Nicosa's uh, overall question, it's still gonna be probably several hundred people in the county that we could reach. If they, if they sign up. Well, there's that. Yeah, we can't, we can't force them to sign up. So there's a lot of, a lot of things that are keeping the numbers down, but, but mostly it's the, it's the uh, saturation of the signal or the inability to saturate the signal into some of these areas. So the, the contract that we sign for the ARPA, it would be to provide the service to everybody, whether they take it or not. So the idea was if, you know, if they're needing to put something up additionally because 2,500 out of 2,500 subscribe, then they would need to do that. But Correct. they would have the funds to do that. And also remember, we do have a, um, on this contract, it has three years, and then they start paying us a percentage for using these towers. So, you know, there's, we're hoping it succeeds for our part to get some of these funds back in very small part too. And, and, and I know it's been a long discussion, but I, I do want to throw in one thing related to the problem with the federal money, just so you all understand. And if anybody's, you know, frustrated about that too, that they can kind of see what happened. Because to me, if 
the government had just said, we're going to go make it happen and just done it, it would have been done. But the problem is we have Cox and Comcast and all these other companies, and so that money, it went, lawsuits started, and like 30,000 things went in that were filed with the federal government of you're not going to give away money to my competitor to come in here. And so it's taken two years of figuring that part out of how they can even give the money away without the, comp the competitor saying you can't do that. And it was, it was, I don't think anybody thought it through. They just knew they wanted enough money to get out there. And if they had just said you get this many, you get this many, you get this many, and don't complain, it could have been done. But, but the un Mr. Chair, Mr. the unfortunate thing is, is that the federal government through their Inflation Reduction Act and this other act, uh, about 60 percent, it was on the news just the other day, 60 percent of this money going to green initiatives, not, not towards infrastructure, not towards broadband. They're spending the money elsewhere. This whole project, I think, is a total catastrophic failure. If people aren't going to sign up, what are we doing? What are we doing? I you're, think wait, you're wasting, my, you're wasting my tax money. Not you, but we are wasting taxpayers' money today. I don't care if it comes from VATI or the federal government. We're paying income taxes. <laughs> we're all paying income taxes here, and it's not working. We should have just fold our tents right now and just get this whole project up. From and let Cox come out and say we're going to expand our market, they, get in our fiber, and be done with it. They, they wouldn't, and they didn't, and that's why all these grant funds came, because if the financial model had worked, Cox would have expanded. I wish the Gazette's back there. I, this is an interesting uh, special interest case. I hope you guys write about this. Uh, let, the, let the public know what's going on back in this county with this catastrophic failure of broadband expansion in Gloucester County. I think, just to interject, I think Ms. Seale has made a point. You know, Cox is not going to do something that's going to cost them money. And the case in point of the gentleman that you helped out, he obviously emailed all of us and he went to Cox and Cox said no and went through all that, you know, rigmarole. Fortunately, you were able to help him out. But how many other people would like it? But Cox is going to say, well, you're at 260 feet. So therefore, because you're 10 feet further from where we would go, it's, it's a financial model for them. They're not going to put in anything over the amount that they've agreed upon. Why they can't expand beyond 250 feet, I don't understand. It's, but it's a it's financial all, it's model. All about, it's all about a private, you know, it's all about making money. Uh, and it's why your bill, I have Cox too, and I look at my bill every month. And um, yeah, they, it's all about making money. It's very different than when the country decided to go electrification. And that was done rapidly, rapidly. Right. But it wasn't because there was an individual competitor here or there. It was done to help everyone in the country. And that was done very successfully. This is quite a different story because it's being run by private industry with the idea of making money. And, and it's with the technology that keeps changing. If you look at what we're getting in our taxes that we have that are collected from Cox and our franchise agreement, it's like this. So we, we are going to have a point where we're going to have very little coming in because many people have drop service, which makes Cox's expansion even more difficult to do. Which is why our bills go up. <laughs> so, Mr. Chair, Mr. I, I would suspect for you good folks, not to just besmirch you good folks, but you guys are a private business. You're seeing that, you know, you're seeing this is not working out financially the way it should be for you guys. It's, it's inevitable that someone's going to, in your company, is going to make a decision. Let's 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 cut the bleeding now before we bleed any more, and just stop the effort. Uh, I, you can't answer that question, but I suspect that your your financial managers and your CEO would say, you know, this is not a viable option for us. Gloucester County is not a money maker for us. We're going to just shut it down. So there, how much longer are you contractually obligated to be here? I think we had the three year, right? Wasn't that the initial? Three years of free use. And I don't, I don't, haven't heard anything from my upper management, which is the ownership, um, indicating any idea about leaving the county. 
I've, I've had conversations, and I'm sure Eric has as well, with the CEO, and they have no intention of doing that. That doesn't mean it won't happen. I'm well, just saying that it's they understand that you all are very concerned about that, and they are saying, look at the commitment we have with a full-time staff person who's not nearly making 15, 16 customers does not pay his salary. They are committed to being here. And I think this is, it's a very complex situation. I hope the Gazette does run an article on it, and I hope the conversation will continue. Um, I would also like to say that even if people don't subscribe right now from an economic development point and also from just quality of life that like Mr. Gibson was talking about, Gloucester County needs broadband. That's just like but, gotta but have it. Want it. So, well, Some don't. Some don't, but may many add, do. May I add a couple points uh, to Mr. Bazzani? Uh, the, the state has 1.45 billion that they were able to get out of this 40 plus billion that the federal government put up. It's the, probably the largest in the country right now, the first ones to actually get money. But like Ms. Steele said, it's been held up by courts and I've been to meetings in Richmond. Gloucester is not the only one struggling with trying to get money for bead. It, 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 this program that BEAD has is, there's so much potential in it and it's being held up everywhere. The, not just Comcast and Cox and Verizon, Norfolk and Southern is holding it up because you've got to cross over railroads. It, it's, uh, it's not just a Gloucester problem. I just want to make that clear. It's, it's, uh, it's a statewide issue and it's a uh, countrywide issue, honestly, with trying to get these funds released and get them in a fair way that the vendors are okay with. Is it because the big boys are suing, going to court, preventing these small companies from expanding broadband and locally? It's, no, it's got to be, be the big boys saying, I don't want this competition in this county. It's because a lot of the big players are the, are the first ones out. The ones that are laying fiber are the first ones out. But they don't, like Ms. Steele mentioned, they don't want Verizon playing in their Cox playground or vice versa. And they've, the way that these areas in the state have been divided up among the vendors Cox may have the first right to refusal in an area, and until they refuse, Verizon can't or Comcast can't come in and do anything. Uh, so that's part of what's holding it up. The vendors are holding it up. Well, let's go to your presentation, because I mean, for, so what I've seen tonight is basically the same thing we saw November 8th of last year. Nothing has changed. I won't say that you're going to see a whole lot different in what I'm going to present. All right. Well, but thanks. Let's see it. <laughs> thanks, sir. Yeah, I'll let you have it there. <laughs> Was this yours? So, uh, again, we're uh, just sort of giving an update on what has transpired in the last, or where we are now. I'm not going to say what we've done from day one to here, but where we are now. So next slide. Progress uh, in what we have done and then what our next plans are going forward. So we're continuing, as we said, to do installs. Uh, they're not going nearly at the rate that any of us would like them to go, but we are still doing installs, um, both non-line of sight as well as uh, line of sight, line of sight being one that can actually see a tower and we can, that we have something on, uh, uh, one of our transmission um, entities on. And that uh, the speeds that we're getting are all above what the grant speed requirements are, whether it be VADI, which was a 25 download, three upload, or the bead when it comes around, which is 100 uh, download and 20 upload. We're exceeding that in, uh, in all of our installations. Next. So I meant to bring a nice pointer and point these out, but on the left, uh, this is actually just across the line in Matthews, that's the North River there, but they had uh, a competitor's installation there. You can see the, the, what looks like a satellite dish, but it's actually pointed at a, a pole that was in uh, a gentleman's yard, uh, again, just on the county line. And then, so we removed that and you can see sort of a square over there in just about the same location up in the, uh, up, just where the trees start in the upper center of the portion of the uh, picture. 
uh, and that was the, the speeds that I was able to get. Um, it's not what they contracted for, but that's what I was able to get raw data right straight out of the, uh, out of the, uh, the BN, which is the broadcast node with Tirana on the, uh, the North End Tower. Next slide. We're doing a project at uh, the, what I call the mural building, um, the new artwork space where she's gonna be doing a shared work um, building. Uh, and this is a line of sight device looking right straight at that water tower. And that's the raw data um, that I got from that device. Next. And this is at uh, Peninsula um, Hardwood Mulch on 17, fairly close to the Page Tower. And again, that's the raw, um, raw output from the Tirana that's up on the Page Tower. We did have uh, pretty good usage over the Gloucester Daffodil Festival timeframe, several hundred unique um, entries showing that people did see the Open Gloucester Network and made use of it. And that's a speed test that, uh, that we did subsequent to the test, or to the uh, festival, but showing what we, uh, what we can get out of the Open Gloucester. So with the non light of sight it's in a, a type of radio frequency that's called CBRS, or Citizens Band Radio System, not the old microphone 40 channel thing, but something that used to be owned exclusively for the Navy. Well, the Navy relinquished some control over it. The FCC put it into the hands of the citizens for this uh, broadband radio system, but the Navy still has an override on it when they want to test their equipment. When that happens, they can kick everybody off. Well, some of the vendors worked with the FCC to come up with a new process that when the Navy wants to do their testing, they don't just kick everybody off, they now go and look for an alternate frequency to move the um, transmission to, then they move the transmission and then they tell the Navy, okay, you're clear to go, basically. It's a, a more of a handshake um, that's really resulted in a lot less service interruptions. We might have one every two weeks that could last anywhere from five minutes to two hours. Um, and since May, I don't think we've had any, if most, we've had one. So it's been much, much uh, improved for customers um, all over both counties. Next. And they are currently evaluating a request by the industry to increase the allowed transmission power off of these towers. Uh, right now we can get 27 watts, I think it is, is all we can transmit off of these towers. And uh, to give you a, a reference as to what that is, you know, our, our transmission on a, um, a BN from Tirana, it's about a 17 by 17 box, 27 watts. And then you look at the cell phone antennas that are, what, five, six feet tall, and they're putting out about 300 watts. So it talks a little bit about how penetration can work better on maybe cell phone signals because they have a lot more power and a lot bigger antennas that they're allowed. So. So we're hopeful that that'll go through, which should give, as we said, more penetration in the dense areas and, and hopefully greater coverage um, off of the same equipment. Well, I don't know yet whether we would be able, or the company would be able to increase the power with the equipment that's there. That's something they'll have to tell us in the future. And this is a, a shot of the, the DHCD folks when they came down in the in the late spring to do the beginning of the Vati closeout. They were doing a tour around the different facilities. So those devices you can see in the upper left and just to the right of center are the Tirana BNs. And this is up on top of the uh, Page Water Tower. Next. And those are the approximate areas that they are aimed, but you can see the, it, it's sort of washed out in here, but it's sort of a peachy area. That's the, the heat map area of what those, um, those radios should cover. Um, so Greg, the mm -hmm. peach colored or the color. blue color? The blue is, is sort of the, the fan that the, 
transmission is directed towards. The peach is where you should be able to pick up that fan. So there's no, there's no blue dots in there. The, and I was going to say the red dots are all unserved customers in Gloucester, and that gives you an idea how they're spread out throughout the county. And uh, there's a couple neighborhoods that Cox just didn't get down to. And so when we did the original plan, we would have hit all the way to the water. But, but the peach area doesn't show any homes in that area. No, Correct. and that's so because so the original no towers plan. towers are broadcasting nothing. A lot of empty field, the solar right. farm that's back there. So the idea would be, and we looked at the 614, the convenience center on 614, if we could have gone there, bounced to a, one of these poles, and then turned that going out to these red dots. But unfortunately, even in testing that, it wasn't enough. It's better. But what they need to do is drop a tower down that's going to reach all those red dots. And it's finding the location that's affordable and works. And that's one of the, the real challenges is when you look at how spread out these red dots are, and in only a couple of areas are there even more than three or four of them, to try and come up with either singular locations or that many locations where you can put a tower, um, and, and to let you know, in other areas of the country, we're on uh, grain silos, or people have put up private towers, believe it or not, I guess these are ham radio operators, and they have their ham uh, antennas up on these towers, and they let us, let us go up and mount on those in other areas. And truthfully, Gloucester doesn't have a lot of that. I was surprised, as rural as we are, and as much... Uh, farmland as we have, there aren't a whole lot of silos in the county. There's a few here and there, but not as many as I would have would have thought once I started looking for them. Carol, what about much Comco State Park? They we talked us, to them and, and they they're, they're, no, no, definitely right not interested. In the middle of the middle of the park. State money. They, they, won't they, let they won't let us put a tower, which I think would reach an awful lot of those red dots. Yeah, but, but JJ, Dr. Orr. I'm just I'm just a dumb old scrap guy. I'm a dumb old but, but you've got your PhD, so but it doesn't make sense to me. And just looking at this blue arc where it's going out, it doesn't even hit half the damn houses that it's going after. I mean, even if it goes straight out, it's going to the point. It's not going to the bulk of the houses where it needs to go. Well, again, that's the, these, these, these radios have what they call a, a transmission width, and they are variable. These are approximately 60 degrees, something, eh, a little bit more than that. But um, it doesn't mean that you can't be off axis and still pick up the signal, because the signal is radiating. You're right. I, but but to your you. point, but it's, it's not you reaching. could you just turn that a little bit? You it, so you're <laughs> Yeah, and that is something that we could potentially do. I, but, 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 but why didn't you? That's this was the map, or the, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the zone that we looked at that wasn't all, th these are unserved markets. There are other homes and businesses in these areas, excuse me, in these areas as well that aren't showing up on this map. This, those aren't the only places in the county. I, I, I understand. So, so we, we were but trying I'm, to hit a, an overall bulk. But I'm just looking at this map as you presented it, because mm -hmm. that's what we have, because you presented sure. it. Sure. We didn't present it to you. But you've got the whole area of Coke right there. That there, There's a whole lot of little dots that are there together. That it looks to me that if you just turn that a wee bit to the west, you'd get those, potentially get those houses so it wouldn't be out of your radius. Mm -hmm. Uh, potentially we could, and we can turn that but antenna. But it's not potentially okay. could or should or have or may or whatever else. Why didn't we? Uh, my guess, and again, uh, we would have to get with Kent and uh, be happy to phrase this question directly to him and get him to email it back to the board, but his intent was to hit a, as broad a range overall of people and businesses. It was not specifically aimed towards... Uh, unserved. So, so I'm just going to follow up on Mr. Hudson. 
So what he's saying, and that you, you seem to support that, if you turn that little blue radius okay. thing over to that, you could reach those people? I don't know that. Oh. I, because I if, you look at the, if you look at the peach, just the peach areas, but peach yeah. degrees, we that. definitely want to follow up on this part. Now, if if the blue wasn't there and that you were just looking at the peach, I would say it's the foliage that's killing it. But the blue is what's making me wonder. I mean, it, first of all, is that truly representative of where the signal is going as far as the blue pointing? And then the secondly is, I believe we called for 360 degrees at the page site so we we want to follow up on this particular part and and figure out because I, I understand exactly what you're saying it's just turn it and hit those but I, I believe that that uh, my first thought is that that blue is not representative of where the angle is either way we need to check that out with them and I want to throw Ms. in, go ahead. Ms. Steele, I, I appreciate what you're saying, and if it's 360 degrees, maybe they should have this designed differently. But as I said, November 8th of last year, there were complaints about not hitting people, not hitting any that in the body gr grants. We're going to hit other people. So let's figure out. If I'm coming in here and presenting to the board, to staff, to the citizens of this county, I'm going to present something that I would have talked to somebody or for 360 degrees, it's going to be blue all the way around that. I'm going to present it so it makes it look like you're saying that we're not presenting or getting anything in this area because of foliage. That's fields right there. Yeah, I, I so, don't. I mean, you're looking at it and you've got Peninsula Hardwood who has it and they're right at the tower. And you've got solar fields and everything else. So there's not a lot of foliage that's stopping that. But if you look at the whole thing, uh, and I think staff knows me well enough that if you're going to sit there and do a presentation, do a presentation that actually is representative of what you're trying to say and not just do part of it, which you think it's okay. Because to me, this is worse than any grammatical error that any slide has ever had. So this, this is isn't ours, too. Right Understand, is. this is not ours. I'm not saying and, it is. And I'm, but, but you're sitting there and saying, making defense on the different things. Like I said earlier, this is the... How many um, people have signed up for any of it in the county since last November? What do you mean by signing Body up? or... In terms how of... How many... What is your... Uh, Total number take, of your take since last November. How many people? Uh, the the total number between the two counties is. I, we're lost, lost a county. The sixteen is the total I number we have. I think that's all since last yeah. November. Well, I think we had Maybe. six or seven of them last year. Yeah. So we've gotten nine. Something like that total. Yeah. It's like the eight the eight charging stations that the federal government has allocated. <laughs> Two but, trillion dollars. But see, that, but, but I'm, I'm going to stop you on that because we don't have anything to do with no, the charging no, stations. I, my point is, we wasting need to taxpayer dollars. We need to look at this that nothing's been accomplished in, a, in right. 11 months for nine dollars. people. Nine, back there. nine takes. And they're not off of this tower. Okay. This tower was just recently connected. If um, and this is no offense to Greg, but if the comment, I don't, if the comment of why this is looking like this is because they were trying to reach the bulk of the people, like in other words, get people to switch service, then that would, they're allowed to go after anybody, but we paid them to get the unserved. So I, I want to follow up on this. I'm, I'm questioning it as well. And again, my um, first thoughts were that if this is something to do with woods, but if it's not, and if they're not delivering, we need to follow up on it. And we have been working with them to try and help. And so this is something that it's, you know, we, we definitely need to figure out what's going on and are we getting that fulfilled on the page tower. Um, I wanted to mention okay. that as an example, we, when you're talking about the different towers, we contacted Dominion of whether they would allow a, a tower, I mean a pole, to go on top of the tanyard landing light that we have, because there's a light there. 
And um, normally we thought they would say, no, that is one of the potential ones. So they do these kind of heat maps to see what's going to happen. And we haven't had to test that yet. All of these, I mean, like I said, this just came out, but it's not good. <laughs> Definitely not good. How much more stuff are you going to do? <clears throat> Mr. Chair, may I? Just, Absolutely. Just for a second. Okay, so we're looking for sites for two of the four towers, right? Or maybe all four better sites. So who's looking for those sites? Is it the county or open broad broadband? The county is working with them. But whose obligation is, to, is it to find the sites? It is theirs, but we are knowledgeable okay. about what might be county property. Well, or could we have an update of their progress in securing alternate sites? Like today or tomorrow. Right, because like they contacted I'm, the solar I'm hearing, company. I'm hearing that we've heard that we can't cite the two of the four where we wanted to for a long time. There so could we get an update of their efforts in the regards of trying to find alternate sites? Because if you can't cite the towers, you can't provide the service. Because we've had I'm hearing nothing, so I'd like that. The four were there last year, built, ready to go, mm -hmm. in Georgia. Right. And so, so we want to cite we want to cite them here. No, but my point is they were sitting there last year, 11 months ago, and we still haven't put them anywhere. I know. So let's get an update, please. Absolutely. Move on, Mr. Chair. Yes. Yes. I have a So at uh, at the Gloucester Point Tower, we have located both. Tirana, uh, non-line-of-sight equipment, as well as Cambium line-of-sight equipment. And uh, this is a, a picture of the equipment up on the top when they were doing the install. We have run into a huge obstacle with Verizon. We have been in application process with them since May of this year. Um, I don't even know how many emails it is by now. It's 50-some-odd exchanges back and forth. And they keep, at one point it was stuck in their process and they wouldn't make any effort to move it. And it finally moved in their process to some other state. They continue to throw jargon at us even after we ask for clear dates for when the next process is gonna be. And it's just been a nightmare. But as soon as we can get the fiber circuit in there, we're ready to fire up uh, the, the equipment on the tower at, at Gloucester Point. And the next slide will show what we think is going to be the coverage. Um, that's just on the Toronto. It doesn't have anything to do with line of sight. We don't have a, a heat map for that. Um, now, this is not going to cover out where a lot of the most recent um, information regarding the feed non-serve market is, which is over... Uh, I don't know the name of the area, but out uh, equivalent of where Cuba Island is, but on the on the mainland, so to speak, there's a large number of uh, homes over there. And so I know one of the possible alternate areas we were looking at was out in the uh, Browns Bay area there at Matthiason's Oysters Oyster Processing Place. But again, it's not it's not going to hit everything. It, it needs, we need more vertical assets is what it really amounts to, to hit as much of the county as the county wants us to hit. It's just going to take a lot more equipment than what is currently out there. And that's something we would have to have other, other communications around, other, other talks with you guys about. So. Uh, to, to your point, Mr. Gibson, what we were doing uh, marketing-wise, these are some of the things that we're continuing with. Facebook ads should be going out later this week in the page area. Uh, mailers were, were uh, hitting the, um, the U.S. mail this week, and then uh, the emails are already out, and we're starting to get some, some inquiries back on those. I think, yeah, where do we go from here? Next slide. Um, again, the late possible revised layout that we've been having discussions about is a potential area we can go and then we do plan to add additional equipment at the landfill tower and we've been having discussions with the county about adding additional equipment at the north tower or james store tower as well um, and um, we hope that those would reach 
some of those uh, underserved areas. They're not listed on the actual uh, unserved, but I think a lot of them are because I've run into a number of um, a number of folks, particularly in like Rantang and whatnot, that they say they talk to Cox and it's $8,500 to $12,000 to get a line pulled to their house. Um, you know, that's just not tenable for anybody. So there may be other questions. Feel free. And if you if you guys have anything specific that you would like either Alan or Kent to address, um, yeah, they they plan. They want to be up. The CEO and the CTO want to be up for the November meeting. Um, and unfortunately, I might not be able to make it because that's the day after elections and I'm on the board and we would be counting votes, the canvases that, that night. So I might not be able to make it. If we finish in time, I'll certainly come as well. But uh, OK, if you guys have any questions, please feel free through Carol or Eric and we'll try to get uh, answers to you as soon as can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next item on the agenda. It's fiscal year 24, preliminary year end. Unaudited financial update, Ms. Galloway. Thank you, Brittany. Good evening. So this evening I'm gonna be providing an update on how we ended fiscal year 2024. A reminder always, the disclaimer, this is unaudited, and I'll try to make this as quick and smooth as possible. <clears throat> as always, I'd like to hear your recommendations or suggestions for future presentations. If there's anything I'm not doing or saying that would be helpful for fu the future, please let me know. Quick agenda, we're gonna run through the general fund, revenues, expenditures, Fund balance update, we do have a new um, grant update and I will also provide tonight and then we'll go through some of our major funds. Starting with general fund revenue, um, general fund revenue exceeded budget by 1% this fiscal year. That's about a million dollars. That blue line, this is the same chart I provided in the past just with new numbers, that blue line shows 100% of the budget and you can see those revenues that did not meet that budget and also those that did. Um, notably, the property tax did not meet budget. This is not a surprise. This is something we discussed in the last quarter as well, and I'll provide additional details on that in the next slide. Also notable, those revenue sources that you see that are 150% to 250% of our um, of budgeted of budgets, uh, those are small revenue sources, so I would love to think they were big ones, but they did make a difference in, in picking up some of the slack for some of those revenues that didn't meet budgets. Property taxes, so uh, real estate and personal property, here are what we've highlighted. That chart on the left, the green is the budget for 24, the blue is the actual, so you can see we didn't meet for real estate, we did exceed just a little bit for personal property. Real estate ended the year at just over a million dollars under budget, that's a big number. Uh, we are attributing that to new construction being less than we expected, which is a theme you'll see in other funds as well, um, notably the utilities later in the presentation. Elderly and veter veterans relief, we discussed this in depth throughout the budget process as well as in third quarter, uh, that totaled $1.067 million, and so that impacts the revenue as well. Personal property, as I mentioned, did do well. It a met budget and exceeded by 250,000. Public service corporation taxes, which actually had been waning in past years, the um, State Corporation Commission seems to have caught up with assessments and the revenue actually came in over budget by 138,000. And in total, property taxes came in, all those pluses and minuses, property tax category came in 550,000 under budget. So I said total general fund revenue over by a million, property taxes under by 500, how did we, how did we make the difference up? So some of the difference, a large portion, is other local taxes that did very well this year. This indicates people are still spending. 
So that's a great thing for our community. Um, we've also had some great numbers in tourism recently. And we can see that here in these four, first four um, green lines. That's again, 100% of our budget. And you can see everything with the green star exceeded budget. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah, maybe you'll answer this later, but I know uh, in the budget process last year, this was brought up uh, by Mr. Bazan and the others regarding the Commissioner of Revenue, the extra person that would be able to yeah. pursue additional uh, taxes that would offset the cost of that individual. I'm not sure if that's part of that. And I know I looked at some of your numbers in the, uh, the uh, hand, you know, our budget process, I mean, the um, hand that we had. Um, is, that, is that something that we can point to as a success, that that extra money did bring in lots of extra money? Yeah. I, I'll let Ms. Steele. Ms. Steele actually got correspondence from the commissioner on that. Um, she had a very positive correspondence, and I was thinking that might have gone to you all, too. Yes. Um, but if, if not, I'll, I'll send that out again. But the, that position was filled just prior to the fiscal year. Okay. So it, um, I think you're going to see more of that in the, a year from now. But it's already gone very well in what she's been able to pick up. I mean, I think that's really important because I know there was quite a bit of discussion during the budget process right. about I think additional she, I personnel think, yeah. and where they were properly placed. And you know, this was a position that our commissioner thought that we would recover significant funds above and beyond. She's the cost a, of a that dedicated um, board member uh, viewer, so I'm sure she's watching right now. But I will. Um, <laughs> I mean, I will, she made a strong case for it. And, she did, uh, and, and I think that and was as, relevant. And her first correspondence of how well it was going, but it would be in this fiscal year, pretty much not last, because okay. It, okay. I think she was able to hire. We were allowed it to pull forward, but I don't know. It would have just been the very end of the year. And I, we'll, I, I don't know. I know that this was trending above the the due date for this for the business license is in March, and I know that it was already trending above budget at that time. So I don't know the exact um, last quarter that we brought in, but I'm happy to work with Ms. Uh, with, with the commissioner and make sure that we understand the impacts of that position. So business license, meals tax, lodging tax, those three tax sources in uh, alone were more than $675,000 over budget. So right there, they made up a good chunk of that deficit that I just mentioned, which is great news. I also wanted to point out in recordation, that is something that's showing above budget here. That includes that out crazy solar sale. So that is something that, while it was great to have this year, it's got about a little more than $100,000 in it from one single sale that I don't think we're gonna expect to see in future years. So that won't be built into future budgets, but um, it did help us here. General fund expenses, this chart shows again percent spent. So that blue line is 100% spent. You can see that most of our general fund expenditures fell between 60 and 85-ish percent spent of their total budgets. So in total, general fund spending ended the year 5% under budget. That's about four and a half million dollars. So that's a big number too, so let's talk about that. Of that four and a half million dollars, Almost $2 million of that is transfer savings. That's that big gray chunk of the pie at the bottom there. So what transfers are is any general fund support of other funds. So down on the bottom right, I've provided the budgets and actuals of each fund that the general fund supports. So Children's Services Act, they are returning about 659,000. And that, as you may remember, Ms. Kersey came in uh, the, earlier this fiscal year and requested additional appropriations because some of the children that she um, was placing, there were more costs involved. So she requested additional money that you guys provided and she needed some of that, not all of it. So that's where that money's coming back right there. Social services is returning about $600, $625,000. That's fairly consistent. We see them generally return of about $500,000. Debt service fund, the $507,000 $507, there is the one, uh, debt payment for the radio lease that we had built into fiscal year 24. We're not paying that until 25, so we didn't have to transfer that money over. But it is built into the fiscal year 25 budget. 
Lastly is that schools number, $502,000. What One thing I wanted to mention is we have been, um, our auditors were on site last week and I have worked fairly intensively in the last three weeks with our schools uh, and found a few, we've, we've found a few things that may impact that number. So there is a potential that number is going to decrease and I will certainly provide updates as soon as I can on that for you. So the other large piece of that pie was vacancy savings. Vacancy savings is our personnel budget. So that is the difference between what we budgeted for personnel and what we actually spent for personnel. We also brought this up in the third quarter financial presentation that it was trending high. So I went back five years and I looked at a turnover rate to try to understand and make sense of this number because in the bottom right you can see actual vacancy savings it was 1.3 million. It's pretty significant although it is less than, it's a fairly small percentage of our, um, of our total budget, about 3.7 of our personal personnel budget. So in percentages, not a huge number, but that turnover rate, <clears throat> as you can see, did increase from fiscal year 23 to 24, almost 2%, and it almost reached back up to fiscal year 22 levels, which is the last time that we did see that large vacancy savings. So, and on that turnover rate, it may vary from what you're gonna see from our human resources department because I'm looking from a budgetary perspective. I'm only looking at positions funded with general fund dollars here and that our human resource department, when they look at turnover, they're also advertising for utilities and social services and other positions that are funded with different, different sources. So of that vacancy savings, 84% came from these five departments, engineering, building inspections, human resources, and Commonwealth attorney all had fairly significant staffing changes in fiscal year 24. Sheriff and jail, a lot of that was actually from health insurance. And what happens with health insurance, it's a part of our fringe benefits and it's a large number. So in our budget, we, we budget a median. And if somebody leaves that had the highest health insurance option, somebody new comes in, doesn't need health insurance it can create close to a $30,000 swing one way or another. So there, there's a chunk of that in here as well that was from health insurance. <clears throat> so all of that rolls up into the calculation for the fund balance. So this is our first time seeing this chart with our new adopted budget figures at the top. So that 141 million is our basis for our calculation. And I have a slide after this that kind of touches on that just a little bit. Um, if you go down towards the middle where the blue number is, that 28.9 million, what that is is our starting fund balance at the 29.4 from last year's audit. We're pro I'm projecting we're gonna use about $400,000 this year and we're gonna end the year about 28.9 million. And then we have to take out of that anything that was, uh, has already been allocated in the fiscal year 25 budget, which is down there by the yellow, and then we can get to our 26.6, which is an approximate ending figure for fiscal year 25 that we're going into or in the middle of. So then over to the right, that smaller chart has our maximum, minimum, and midpoints based on our fund balance policy. If you were to take that 26.262 million and, and take away that, those percentages, that's what you would have left. So just a brief, uh, you know, we talk about the fund balance policy all the time. So I just took an excerpt because I do like to go back and, and just look, look back at the policy when I'm um, running the calculations fresh for the first time in a fiscal year. And just to, something that I wanted to bring your attention to is those um, adopted governmental expenditures. So that number is the basis for our whole calculation, but I do wanna point out that number doesn't include things that are grant funded and um, debt funded. So it takes out that, it smooths that piece of the puzzle and really looks at what is funded with county, what would need to be funded with county sources. So that was just the point of, of this slide. And in the policy, it does identify the 15% of these expenditures as really the, the percentage that we would need to um, safeguard the county's fiscal liquidity and cash, cash flow. All right, this next slide is for grants and I have a quick handout I'm going to give out. 
Um, <clears throat> this is kind of a work in progress. Okay, so this is a two-page handout, front back. I tried to make it as large as possible, and that will also be a work in progress because I know it's very small. What this is, you know, uh, of course, Ms. Steele knows what it goes into going for grant funding. And there are a lot of initiatives that wouldn't be possible if it weren't for dedicated staff members that are going after this grant funding. But it requires a lot of work. And so what this is designed to do is that we wanted to show you the impact of the grants and what we're working towards. So this list gives you every single grant in fiscal year 24 and fiscal year 25 on the second page. 24, we kind of came up with this idea of this listing at the end of fiscal year 24. So you're not gonna have as good of metrics of what did we apply for versus denied, those types of things. But we're tracking it in a much better way in fiscal year 25. So that's what I'm gonna highlight here. <laughs> So to date, in fiscal year 25, we've applied for a total of 31 grants. We've been awarded just under 1.5 million in grant funds. Out of those 23 grants, um, nine of them are for one-time initiatives, and I've listed those right there. Uh, the other portion of those grants are ongoing funding for things that are funding our victim witness program, our um, probation and pretrial program overtime for the sheriff's office, which they did get some grants for some additional overtime that's listed here. But there are some very important ongoing things that are also funded with grants that require annual applications. So the, this listing, we would love for you at some point to be able to take a look at it and to provide us feedback on what would be helpful. Capital projects, so in fiscal year 24, we. Uh, invested just under 10 million, 9.899 million in capital improvements. This does not include the high school project that's being reported on by the school board at their public meetings. That 9.899 does include some one-time state funding for the school improvements, some debt funding to complete the transportation facility, some grant funding for the Aberdeen Creek Pier Rehab, and then also that lease that we just mentioned for the radios, about 3.6 million in um, radios. Quick question. Mm -hmm. um, I, I noticed in the old, the old bus garage, there are four metal buildings in there. Did we budget for that? We did, yes. We did. Okay, so that was budgeted. Yes, sir. Thank you. And I should, maybe I should have put a picture of that because that was quite a transformation as well. I haven't seen it personally, but I did take, we have some pictures of some of the other projects that were completed and actually almost all, all of those were completed with Pago County funding. The, the photos that you see on the outside, the library was partially funded by our lessor. Um, but I also wanted to mention we have our um, capital projects website that our budget analyst is managing and she's doing a wonderful job of keeping that up to date uh, about every two weeks. So if you're ever interested in what is going on in the county capital project wise, um, definitely check that, check that link out. They've really solidly built in the ground. And, and, if, and the library is absolutely beautiful. You know, they really did a nice job. And um, if I'm not mistaken, the buildings are helping with utilities inventory. My, our purchasing agent manages utility. She goes and does the count annually, the independent count of inventory. And we've had excellent, excellent reviews this year from that, from her and also from the auditors. So that was a great plus. This is a very brief update on the utilities fund because I expect you'll probably hear more on the utilities fund um, coming up. So a status revenues, water and sewer revenues did meet budget. They actually exceeded budget by about 4%, just a little bit. Um, application and development fees, as I mentioned earlier, we are seeing a decline. We, uh, no, we see, are seeing less development than what we had expected, but we knew about that midway through this year. This is not a surprise at the end of the year, 
but our development fees, application fees came in under budget. So um, those development fees obviously fund the development fund and that was not very highly funded this year <laughs> based off of our actual receipts. Expenditures are off to the right. That is again a percentage spent, that blue line being 100%. And you can see repairs and maintenance were about double what we expected or what we initially budgeted for. That is a small number, I mean, that is not a million dollar number that's doubled there. That is about a $40 million number that's doubled, uh, 40 million, 40,000, gosh, I'm too, <laughs> I've been, it's been not here a for million, a long time. It's, 40 <laughs> it's not a million, it's 40 million. A uh, $40,000 number, that, so you know, when you see that where it looks, it's more than 200% of budget, it is significant, but you can also see the capital projects, which is the largest portion of our budget that we had to reallocate and reprioritize some of those this year. This was, this was a big year of shifting priorities and making sure we're, we're doing the right things first and that capital project spending um, was not fully spent, which is a reflection of that. We're expecting in the end of this year that we'll use about 784,000 of our 2 million budgeted fund balance for utilities. School sales tax fund is doing very well. Um, the, this chart shows 22, 23, and 24 actual re revenues collected. And um, as you can see, each one has done very well, 5.9 million this year. Um, as of the end of fiscal year 24, cumulative, we have re received a total of 17.269 million in tax revenue, 654,000 in interest earnings, and we have spent 3.7 million on debt service for eligible projects. And to give you some perception of where we are, perspective of where we are on that, um, that's a 20, 20 year tax. So we're 15% through that tax and we have collected 16.6% of the tax revenue. So we are ahead of where Davenport expected. Mr. Rosani. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, so earlier this year we were talking about we were $500,000 in the hole going into the next budget season. Are we now, does that number disappeared? I wouldn't say disappeared. I think there's still, it, it's a little early to say that. What do you um, think? Well, if you're talking general funds, not school sales mm -hmm. tax funds, is that? Um, so I think that we still have some, some work to do to finalize that fund balance number. And then looking into fiscal year 25 to see what additional appropriations need to be made. We're the politicians. You shouldn't <laughs> give us the politician's <laughs> answer. Well, I it's don't okay. know if that's a compliment. <laughs> But I will, uh, I think you'll see a, a better update and a more firm update come December on these numbers. But I don't think we're 500,000 in the hole, but we'll be using our savings. We're not using operating money anymore. <laughs> All right, what's next? So we just had our auditors on site last week. Um, and so we are now in the throes of finalizing that audit as well as uh, working through our audited financial statements. So the auditors should be here on your, at your December 3rd meeting to present the audit results. And also budget season started. We had our CIP kickoff meeting with staff today. Um, so we're in the throes of that as well. I'll be back in February as well to present a mid-year financial report. So in conclusion, we did uh, spend less fund balance than we expected this year. Um, so that, that's a result of the vacancy savings, transfer savings, as well as a little bit of additional revenue. Very good. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. If I can, Mr. Chair, I just would like to thank Ms. Calloway for um, all of her hard work and many extra hours, nights and weekends getting us prepared. So, and, and after the last conversation and discussion, that was a big breath of fresh air yeah. for all of us. <laughs> Very easy, like you said. I That's never great. thought financials would be a breath of fresh air, but. <laughs> you've done, you've done a great job um, training her to do political research. <laughs> there, there was no training there, I promise. <laughs> Thank you. I'll turn this on. Okay, Thank you, Ms. Calloway. Yeah. All right, next item on the agenda is citizen comment period like to speak, please come forward, state your name, magisterial address, or district, and please limit your comments to three minutes.
My name is Diane Jones. I'm in the Ware District. Um, just a few things. Um, Cox Cable. I used to have all the package of Cox Cable until I discovered that if I was going to need service on my Cox Cable internet, I had to call them up on my Cox phone. And then they said, well, let me just reboot your system. Then you have to go through the whole system again to find somebody to talk to. And I, I got rid of the phone right quick. Cox, the highest speed internet of Cox, costs me $130 a month. That's cheaper than Starlink by $10. I mean, more expensive, I'm sorry. Dish cost me $150 a month or so. And I don't have any movie channels or anything like that. My smart meter, I think the county should know about smart meters so they can get rid of them. Um, just to reiterate, I got a regular meter, I got an opt-out meter, and uh, because for one thing I didn't ask for the smart meter, I had sent an opt-out form in and of course they lost it. So I had to send it certified return receipt in order for them to change it out. It fried my butterfly bush right down to the roots and I kept getting these vibrations tingling like a TENS unit under my skin. And my bedroom is on the other side of the house from my smart meter, and um, they're dangerous. And I had a lady come out with a radar detector, whatever you call it, and the um, opt-out meters were in a, in a non-toxic level, at a non-toxic level. Um, I would like the, the board to seriously look into, call, call the, uh, real estate agents in the county and find out how many are getting phone calls from China to purchase property in Gloucester County. That's a very serious problem. And I would like you to do some research on that and uh, do something about it. Um, and, I, and I appreciate um, you in the last meeting giving the man his due time, which is under the Constitution. We have a constitutional right to freedom of assembly and redress of, of grievances. So that's, if it, does, if it takes longer than three minutes, then it takes longer than three minutes. Most of us don't really want to be up here talking for three minutes, much less more than three minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Whoops. Would anyone else like to come speak? <laughs> All right, we'll close the citizen comment. We'll move to the regular agenda. Friends of Gloucester County Animal Control donation acceptance and request for appropriation. Mr. Wright. Yes, good evening, gentlemen of the board. Mr. Wilma. Um, so I did want to give you a little bit of background. Many of you may not be familiar with the Friends of Gloucester County Animal Control, but uh, this will be relatively brief. So they were actually formed as a 501c3 in calendar year 23, with the intention being to support and supplement the operations of the animal shelter and ultimately enhance the welfare of the canines held there. So in the last two years, they have raised roughly $17,000 to supplement medical care beyond the basic we're able to provide with the county's budget. One specific example, they actually saved a dog's life. It had a major leg issue and it would have been euthanized, but for a $2,000 surgery that the friends paid for. So they've had a really palpable impact on the welfare of the animals. So specifically for this, they raised $10,000 to help with reconfiguration of the runs that are on the animal shelter property. And we were actually doing a capital improvement uh, project um, which was intended to pave some of the unpaved areas there for parking. And as a part of that, they did regrading of the site as well because, because we had considerable water retention issues and flooding. 
Um, and actually within the, the dog runs themselves, we had considerable flooding whenever there was any kind of a major rain. So they raised the $10,000 with the sole intent of actually incorporating additional runs. So what they're going to do, the company that did or took the fence down and did the site work is going to put the fencing back, but that $10,000 will actually pay for additional fencing within the existing footprint to go from two dog runs to five. So we're going to have additional space for the volunteers to work with the dogs, which will get them out of the shelter more frequently. Um, so you actually have a resolution on page 60 to accept the, do the donation and appropriate it for FY25. So second. Still in all the board. Dr. Orr. Yes. Mr. Smith. Yes. Mr. Hudson. Yes. Mr. Bazzani. Yes. Mr. Nicosia. Yes. Mr. Gibson. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you, John. Are, are you going to develop a cat run too? <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, Ms. Steele, next item on the agenda is discussion of possible retreat dates and topics. Uh, I have not heard anything back from any board members of uh, preferences of uh, a time frame or like I had suggested maybe in December if it would be possible so that if your retreat could help in the budget guidance and development. Um, would still like to suggest that. And I also um, not sure if there's been any individual discussions about um, a full weekday or a weekend or a couple of evenings and what you all would like to do. And, and we're more than happy to send out a, a doodle poll um, and also do some polling for topics if you'd like. And I'm happy to write down any additional topics that you'd like us to include or any priorities that you have um, of some of the suggested ones. So it's really input gathering time. It might be good to make a decision quickly. You want a weekday, weeknight, or weekend? Those three. Because I know uh, people like Chris and others do work. Uh, others like us don't. So I'm not sure. I think we should allow the people who work to give us their opinion about what works best for them. Did Mr. Crisco happen to offer anything to you about the time frame? Okay. I'm, I'm fine holding on a weekday as long as I have enough advance notice and can schedule around it. Tuesdays and Thursdays are good for me. Just tell me when. No, the, the, last the last time we, we did it, it worked out real well. Was it the Tuesday? Was it a Saturday? Was it a Saturday? Was it a Saturday, half day? The last time was a Saturday? A little yeah. over half day? Yeah. Yeah, yeah Whitcomb Lodge. I, I thought it worked. No, I thought it worked. It was I half a day in the county office. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it worked. Oh, that's right. Well, I like that. Well, well based on Ms. Steele's recommended topics, my math doesn't math. But that's more than a day, oh, a half more a day. Than, right. Mm -hmm. Oh, we more than half a day. Well, it could be one day Saturday. Would, I, I think doing the poll you know, on the dates and on the topics would be, be helpful. For me to get off yeah. in the classroom as these November and December yeah. come, in, come into being with um, sickness and travel and other things. So, it's December is pretty, as a classroom teacher, especially in the high school, December is pretty rough as far as being able to take off. What about first week of January? I will have already presented the capital oh, right. improvement budget, which is fine, but just mention that. And the first Saturday in December is the Christmas and holiday events here in, on Main Street, so I know you wouldn't want to do it that day. If you, you want to go to Saturday. Saturday. So we can all yeah. I'd definitely do that. And one other thought I had, um, and you can offer your opinion now or, or later as well. Um, we've done a lot of renovation, as you all know, um, that the board approved in the senior center. And um, 
we could ask, we have permission to, you know, we can get permission to utilize the facility if they're not open. And so they're not on Saturdays. They also um, don't have seniors coming in on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, and I'd love for you all to see that site. And it's also would have uh, privacy and things, but it'd be good to see what the staff have done because it's almost been all internal. We've had a few contractors. Who's done internal? Most of it. The well, painting that's good. still ongoing is being done by a well, contractor. Thursday's work. Let's look at Thursday, the 28th of November. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're going to the turkey? Turkey. You're the turkey. <laughs> I think y'all be watching football, <laughs> even if we had turkey. <laughs> I'll, I'll be glad so what, to send out so a poll. So what is, what is the thought? Saturdays or during the week? It's a pair. Listening to Mr. Nicosia, it doesn't sound like during the week works. Saturday works for me. Okay, or would it be better to have it two nights and break these topics down? No. I know. So you want Saturdays. But I don't think it's going to be a half a Saturday, is my point. It's going to be more of a whole day Saturday. We've done that before, too. We've done it. I know, I know we've done it. I think it's okay to do a whole day on Saturday. Okay. With me. I mean, that's just... So let's... You're retired. You can fish any day of the week, JJ. Hush. Um, so look at some Saturdays that don't conflict with county events. Okay. And let's see what we can do. Okay. Sounds right. great. Start your holiday shopping now. So <laughs> we'll get you that. You better part. shop now because there's nothing going to be in the store shortly. <laughs> well, with the longshoreman strike, you may not get anything in the stores. Santa can. I've been going all day. They get back. Well, I'm saying. Yes, but I had to get something today at Sam's. And Sam's was crazy. And it was yeah, ridiculous. Supply and demand, JJ. Oh, yeah. They were fighting in the parking lot. They were buying people. And they were buying yep. toilet paper like it was COVID. Are you kidding? No. <laughs> okay, so Saturday. Okay, now let's get back to topic. Um, speaking of topic, topic items. Anything on here that you'd like, want to amend? Or is there something that's not on this list that's on page 63 that you would like to add to? Think about, I'm going to think about it. We can think about it, but I've been thinking about it since I saw the list. Well, I was getting ready to say, you've seen the list. Let's think. I know. Well, um, I think because of the budget process, it's going to be so critical this year in lieu of how we developed the budget last year. Um, I think that should be, for me, a priority of our first element of this discussion. And one of the things that might work well is for the board to decide what we want as presentations from staff. Um, one of the things that I think would have helped our commissioner was, you know, some detail about how things have changed in her, in her staff. So some summary statistics from people that are asking for increased revenue or positions to understand what their needs are. Because, like, for example, I went to, um, at the library meeting the other day and um, Diane, Mr. Burgess was presenting lots of data about it. It'd be nice to know what's happening with these different groups. Is it improving, changing, uh, underutilized, or whatever, just so that we understand how these different departments are working. I like graphics and uh, how things are going. And um, as the case of the commissioner, she made a strong case for how things would operate with this additional person having that additional information I think would be very valuable. I think I can um, work with the staff on to give some summaries of those things. I just uh, wanted to caution that I would not have their operating budget request enough like that. Specific things about hearing more from staff who might be asking for additional money would probably be best at the work sessions. But I think some general, how are things going? Where are you? Which direction? And, and again, some changes that have happened in staffing, just yeah. letting you know different people have yeah, come I mean, I thought home. about like one component. You know, we get a weekly report from our sheriff. You know, Mr. Rice sends us that, you know, how are things going in the county with regard to crime? Um, you know, we hear all these different statistics nationally. How is Gloucester doing? Because I think the citizens would be interested in knowing 
you know, how crime rate is stabilized up, up or down or whatever. You know, that could be part of his presentation to the, to the, um, the supervisors. I think the list is good as it is. And maybe add some that Dr. Orp added. And what we can do beforehand is just arrange some of them, prioritize them. Mm -hmm. And then if we run out of time, they just get moved. And what I was thinking is not, I could ask for input on the doodle poll or separate from the doodle poll, but um, as I went through and looking at again, like um, I, there are many staff who would be coming in and out to present these topics. So I'd really like if we know there's not going to be time ahead of time, then, then we would move that to a work session. For example, I had uh, tasked and talked to Quentin about doing the media contact during emergencies. I mean, if you just look back and what it's been happening the last week. Board members are thrown in front of cameras and other times for whether it's an active shooter, whether it's a hurricane, and was just going to work with y'all on that. And I've got um, Ted would be potentially doing the FOIA if that goes on the list. Eric would be helping on some. Maria, uh, Ann Ducey Ortiz, Tammy. So I think if I can, um, I'll add a little bit to goes out with and that way if we know that it's just going to not have time again i'll schedule them for a, um, a work session later on yeah let's, let's but, we can rank some of those topics and based on our the for you that we have to do with ted doing 60 minutes that's probably too long anything that ted's too long <laughs> <laughs> I know, but I meant we already have to do the FOIA training. Yes, sir. So, to do so if you did it online, you really don't need much from me, but perhaps 30 minutes. Yeah, work. that's what I'm saying. If we just play yes. with some of the numbers. Yes, sir. Okay. And I'm sure, like the AI presentation, they could do it themselves in less than 45 minutes. Hmm? All right. All right. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, board appointments. I'm working on someone for utilities. Oh, hey, oh. speaking about utilities, we changed the bylaws so that we could take people that are not specific to a district. So there was a gentleman that applied to the utilities, I believe, and because we're allowed to take people, if it's not uh, district specific, we can do that here for utilities. I'm fine with that. Because Cause it's really hard. I mean, we, we face hard this. Find we, people. Yeah, because we face this with the library, the same thing. We had a meeting, and then they can't get people from a certain district. I recommend that they look at their bylaws to alter it a little bit. So, you know, this gives an opportunity for someone who may not be in a particular district that really wants to be part of a committee to be a part of that committee. But should they alter their bylaws or should they? The, I think the libraries would come the into board, the. Also. No, well, the, the each committee alters it, but it's approved by the Board of Supervisors, correct, Mr. 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 Wilmot? Mr. Wilmot. Thank you. Okay. What else are we doing? Well, there's one on utilities that's mm -hmm. on, a, on your pink. Yeah, I'm working on that one. That's oh, so the can, right? Yeah. Oh, the, the, oh, the pink sheet. Yeah. Is that the one you were talking about? I thought I was looking at the book. So that's the, that person, no, sorry. if we approved him, would be okay, right? Well, it's his district on anyway. Yeah, but if you guys can find something, you know, I'm not, I'm not wedded to yeah. my district. I mean, it's I, hard to find people the, to do these things. Yeah, just on, you know, being on the utilities committee, it's really hard to find individuals that are really interested in utilities. Well, but, Mr. Darren Davis, is he interested then? Well, he's applied for it. He's a, okay, yeah. let's. I'm okay with that. Okay. I'm okay with it. You want to nominate him? I'll nominate him. Second. Nominate Mr. Darren. Are all, all in favor? Davis. Yeah. Aye. Aye. Okay, so we need to look at social services. Mr. Gibson? Yeah, I uh, just want to thank Mr. Dixon for his service. Uh, he just resigned, so I do not have a replacement at this time. Right. And also, Library Board, Mr. Nicosi. No uh, replacement at this time. Right. And, and I did say I was on the library committee last the meeting last week, and we did discuss the issues, and they've had the same problem of trying to find dedicated individuals from specific districts. I recommended 
that they follow the protocol that we did for utilities, alter the bylaws, they would then present it to Mr. Wilmot for his approval that would then come to the board that would allow individuals, truly inter interested individuals in helping out, not district specific. Is the library, do they have to be district specific? Yes. Currently, yes, but the, the proposal is to make it not district specific. Because okay, I have someone that's interested. But Good. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's what you want. You want people who are really interested. In there. Yeah. And we can't do it yet. Not yet, no. Point. But if they, I know that we're, we have a meeting in December, and I know Ms. Robertus was going to come to the board with those revisions based on what the utilities did. And so um, from there, Mr. Wilmot will get him to approve it. I've been waiting for, I think, a while for them to act. <laughs> Good luck. Okay. okay. Mr. Wilmot, county attorney items. Hey, wait. Oh, okay. I got one more issue, and this is EDA. Uh, and I asked Mr. Wilmot to help us here. Um, you know, we have a business park. Do you want to wait for supervisor discussion? Because I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna run. Oh, okay, yeah, we can wait for discussion. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Okay, county attorney items. Other than I'm happy to be here. At your next meeting, you will have in front of you some suggested amendments to Chapter 9 of your county code, which is garbage and refuse, which I'm sure is on, the top, <laughs> on everyone's mind. Uh, but, you know, periodically I go through the code and I try and, you know, look at the chapters and suggest changes that may be appropriate. Well, administration and clean community uh, and the Commission on Revenue have suggested some changes to Chapter 9. And so what I intend to do is present those to you in ordinance form at your next meeting, but not to act on, just to look at, to see whether you're comfortable with them, whether you have any questions, whether you want to change anything else. So in the interim, between now and your next meeting in October, if you'd like to look at Chapter 9 of your current county ch code on Municode or through me, just to see if you have any questions or concerns or suggested revisions. It has not been revised in a very long time. In fact, I s circulated some of these proposed revisions 10 years ago, and I hadn't heard anything. So I thought I'd dust it off um, and set it out for the okay. several other times. Um, so we can do that. So if you'd like to look at that, look at it. You'll get it at your next meeting. The anticipation is that we will act on those uh, in November. Okay. So that's it. Okay. Boards and commission reports. Supervisor discussion, Dr. Orr. Okay, so uh, utilities brought up an interesting issue regarding our business park and the recent change in DEQ regulations regarding BMPs. And it turns out that effective June 30th, there was a change in those regulations that I asked Mr. Wilmot to look at carefully because uh, we have two clients that are anxious to move forward in the business park, the last two big parcels. Um, and because land has been disturbed, these new regulations apparently uh, do not allow things to be grandfathered. So at the, util at the uh, EDA meeting, there was quite a bit of discussion. What's grandfather really mean when you have a business park that was established a number of years ago, and they have some BMPs. The question is, do these two new entities have to do their separate BMPs, or the BMPs that are already there can be they be expanded? And it may take a little. You know, apparently they've been trying to touch base with DQ. No one answers. Uh, and Mr. Our uh, uh, environmental officer, Mr. Landry, is sort of caught in the middle. He's trying to do his best, but there's apparently an issue with these new regulations, just like with our water stuff. Uh, they, no one is able to give the EDA the correct answer of what can or can't be done, other than there are these new regulations effective June 30th, 2024. Okay. I've got a quick one. Just for your attention, have you guys noticed the Dunkin' Donuts construction? They built a water treatment plant underneath that facility um, with all the pipes and the tunnels and things like that, all in the name of let's save the bay. Uh, it seems a little ridiculous in my, my view, but 
that's what happened. So I thought you guys would be aware of that. It's all the digging they were doing. I thought, I thought gasoline tanks were going in there, but, but it's an it's a retain, underground retaining pond. I've never seen, does Gloucester have, ever have an underground retaining pond? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay, Phil, well, then Phillips, that one. Did, Phillips did one. Yeah. Anyway, Mr. Wilmot, we may need some help, and it could be that it's a non-issue, but I think that with the existing retention ponds they have there, we just, they just would like some guidance as to whether they can improve those or would each of these new entities have to do their own retention bond? And j just my understanding was that it was looked into and an engineer estimated a price that was more than double the price of what it would cost to, to fix the current one up to standard to allow those others to use it versus them building their own. So I don't know... It sounds like it's a, almost a two-part question to DEQ of when you had this original pond, did it allow all these others to use it no matter what and also the second, use it no matter what and that the pond doesn't have to be brought up to standard because it's kind of like if you go to redo your house and you do too much work, you have to meet the new code. Well, you think about what uh, Mr. Trubicki did with the areas of bay and he knew to do that he, he, and, and yeah, the yeah. other development doesn't meet right. that so I, I think part of the problem might have just been sort of like not being a traditional landowner for development right. and not realizing that people turned in plans years ago to, and then disturbed the land so that they could meet those criteria mm -hmm. so did run off the, the new regulations, 75 pages of them, um, which does not surprise me. But it, there's no one size fits all or one answer fits all. Uh, whether uh, a new development is permitted to utilize currently existing BMPs or not is appears to be dependent upon multiple factors, including what the development is, its proximity, its output based uh, of pollutants and stormwater, uh, it, you know, its proximity to the current facilities, the adequacy of the current facilities. But in order for a new facility to be constructed, it, it doesn't matter that it was already a business park. It has to fall within the you know, current regulations. And so it would have to comply with the current regulations. And so if they haven't disturbed the, the, the soil, they're going to have to do that. They may be able to utilize current facilities, but they're going to have to apply to the DEQ to be permitted to erect whatever facility they're intending. So it's the size of the new facility, what they're doing, what they're producing, what where their effluent is, what the stormwater uh, projected is, what their impervious area is. So there's too many factors to give one blanket answer. Uh, I can't say that they can utilize current facilities because that wouldn't be true. And I couldn't say that they would have to build new ones because I don't know. So it, it, I think it's incumbent upon prospective tenants to do due diligence to see what it is that's required. But I'm here to help, believe it or not. I'm a lawyer for the government, and I'm here to help. I, I want to thank you, Mr. Wilmot, for that. Um, yeah, this came up just last week at the EDA meeting, and the members of the committee were a little bit frustrated because in trying to reach the EQ, no one returned the calls, and that frustrated them, and they just need an answer to the particular questions that we have so that they can move forward with these two groups. One is you know, a pretty significant business for the county that employs a lot of people. And um, they have been working diligently to move forward to pretty soon get started. But I don't want to say who it is, because I don't think I'm supposed to. <laughs> but it's, uh, anyway, it's something that they would like some guidance. And when somebody from DEQ can't call back and give them the time, it's frustrating. Well, if, if you'd like to give them my name and number, I'll do whatever I can to help. Well, I told him that I was going to talk to Mr. Landry. He said essentially the same thing. He, you know, he's quite good and doesn't know what to do in terms of the current advice. I said that I was frustrated with you and 
you know, I guess we have to kind of figure out where to go with the next steps to move forward. And, and I mentioned I was on the phone with DCR yesterday, and um, Virginia took quite a hit with the storm, too. It's just not being made so public. And I think there's seven localities, and they're pulling their state employees to go there and to help. So I would imagine with the situation with stormwater that it may be, it may not have been the reason for before, but I would say getting hold of somebody at DEQ in the next couple of weeks is going to be difficult if they deal with stormwater. Um, but I think between maybe Mr. Baines and, and Mr. Wilmot can talk, and I, I mean, I, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a, not a good situation. Um, but I'm not sure that there's an answer personally that's going to be a that, good that's one. That's what I'm worried about. <laughs> I, I, I don't I know what to tell Sherry to tell the board, give that on the, e, on the EDA rep. Well, from I, I think the, the short answer is that, that the permitting requirements from DEQ are what they are, mm -hmm. and they are very dependent upon the particular business and, and, and site development proposition that they tender, and they have to apply to the DEQ for the permission to do that. So it's very site specific and business specific. Anybody else for supervisor discussion? One item left on the agenda. Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Meeting adjourned.